Are you a student in an interpreter training program wondering what you're going to do once you finish? Or maybe you have already finished and you're saying to yourself, now what? Well, today we're going to talk about one of your options and how it specifically relates to ASL or American Sign Language. Hello everyone, my name is Jim Baker and today we're going to discuss freelance ASL interpreting. So first off, what is freelance? Well, the term comes to us from the 1820 novel by Sir, William, uh, Sir Walter Scott, Ivanhoe. In it, he uses the term freelances to denote, to denote a group of soldiers that uh, basically they're mercenaries, they're soldiers for hire. Uh, they're, they're free to go to wherever to be hired as soldiers. They, uh, they're not beholden to any specific lord or noble or king or whatever. Uh, his novel takes place in medieval times, and so that's what he was describing. He used that term freelance to describe these soldiers. Over the years, that term has grown in its common usage to mean anybody who can accept whatever type of work. It doesn't have to be soldier work. Uh, but they can go, they're free to say, I'm going to work for this person today and this person tomorrow or next week or whatever. Um, and that's, that's where the term freelance comes from. Another term that is used as a synonym for freelance is independent contractor. You may have heard that term as well. So let's talk about various aspects of freelancing and why they may or may not be right for you. First off, did you know that 93% of all interpreters and translators are freelancers? Now, really quickly as an aside, I just want to say there is a difference between interpreting and translating. They're similar, but they're different. We'll talk more about that in a bit. But what this means is that with such a high percentage of, of people doing freelance work, what that means is obviously there's a lot of work out there for freelancers. There's a lot of work available. Now, whether you can actually land a job at that is going to depend on all kinds of things. It's going to depend on what the client's needs are, your experience. Um, it's going to depend on what languages you work in. It's going to depend on your willingness to travel, perhaps, for work, what market you live in, what the demand is in there for your particular language pair, and so forth. Uh, the good news is that freelancing in general is growing, and especially in the interpreting and translating markets, uh, is growing especially for freelancers because remote interpreting and remote translating are becoming more and more popular. It's, it's, it's a lot easier to do something through um, electronic means, electronic communications, as good as they've become nowadays, than it is to have somebody travel long distance, you know, and paying for plane tickets and hotels or whatever. You know, it's easier to, to, to do short term assignments like that electronically. And it's a lot more convenient. The interpreter doesn't have to worry about staying in hotels. They can sleep in their own bed at night. There's all kinds of, of benefits. But the point is, that's growing. And so uh, it, the amount of work that's available for freelancers is growing. It's, it's a great time to be a freelancer right now. Now, the downside of that is that with such a high percentage, 93% of all of them are freelancers, that means you've got a lot of competition out there. And depending on your market, again, you might have more or less. You know, things, there are all kinds of variables that can, that can go into doing it. But one of the biggest things that's going to affect your ability to get work is as you do, you know, as you do take on jobs and you complete them, you're going to develop a reputation. It just naturally happens. You know, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. And as you get that reputation, that can be a good thing for you or it can be a bad thing for you. And it really depends on you. How do you treat your clients and so forth? Um, and how do you deliver the product? How, how well, when you make mistakes, how do you, how do you fix them? Things like this all go into the reputation you're going to build for yourself. And as you build that reputation, it will affect whether you get business more or less. The next aspect of freelancing to keep in mind is that when you are an independent contractor, you're your own boss. Now, a lot of people, especially younger people, like to hear that because they don't, you know, nobody's going to tell me when I got to be to work, when I have to stop work and can't get paid anymore, how much I, I'm worth, what my, you know, what my time's worth, how much they'll pay me. Um, nobody's going to tell me, you know, all these different things, and you know, I get to decide those for myself. Being your own boss has its perks, but there's also a downside. 
And that is, when you're the boss, nobody is going to tell you those things. You have to be the one to tell yourself how early or how late you're going to work. You have to be the one to decide, i got to go to work. It's 7 o'clock. I've set this for my time. Whatever. You know, you know, whatever you decide. But the point is, you have to make those decisions, and you have to be the one to kick yourself out of bed, especially on those days when you just wake up and you go, can I just stay in bed, please? You know, those days are going to happen. Uh, example, uh, my wife and I, for five years, we ran a business in Alabama where a totally different industry, but we were an independent contractor. Our business, we, we accepted clients all the time. We actually rejected work from clients from time to time. It didn't happen often, but occasionally there were some clients that we did because, well, we had one that didn't pay, or we had, we had others that, uh, well, in some cases, we had too much work and we just couldn't. We, we just had to say, sorry, we can't deliver you a good quality product in time, you know, in a good time. It's just, we're swamped, you know. And we had to reject work. And we had other reasons, too, why occasionally we would reject an order here and there, even from regular clients. But the point is, that one business for five years, that was our bread and butter. That's what we fed our family with, paid our bills. And I had to be a self-starter because not being a self-starter, I wouldn't make any money. I don't pay the bills. I had to get myself out of bed. Nobody was going to kick me out of bed and say, you got to go to work. Um, I, you know, I had to do that. If you, you know, so if you're not a self-starter, that's okay. You can learn to be so. If you really want to be your own boss, you have to learn that. If you decide it's not, that's not worth it to you. If you decide, you know what, that's just I don't want to put, I don't want to do that. Then maybe freelancing is not for you, and you maybe want to look into being a an employee, and that's fine too. Um, but this is something you have to decide. Now another aspect of being an independent contractor is the fact that you have to be more aware of your finances and your taxes than a regular employee does. Let me explain how that works. Now, I can't speak to how it works in other countries, but here in the United States, when you are hired by a regular employer, you, they have you fill out uh, what's called a W-4 form. And this form gives them information that they use to calculate how much out of each paycheck they're going to they're going to, how much of your money they're going to keep out of your paycheck and pay to the government for your taxes. So let's say, for example, you work a 40-hour-a-week job making $10 an hour. All right? Well, simple math tells you that in a week's time, you're going to make $400. Right? It's easy, easy math. However, when you get your paycheck, you're not going to see $400 in the check. Now, you, you know, it'll have itemized all the different calculations, it'll start with 400 but the amount you get in the check might be, for example, maybe $372 or whatever, the, the rest of it being whatever they, they kept out to pay to the government on your behalf. Uh, the same thing does not apply as an independent contractor, uh, because as an independent contractor, let's say, uh, let's say I go as an independent contractor, and I, I have several clients, and let's say in a given week I contract a combined total of 40 hours. 40 billable hours at the same rate of $10 an hour. We'll make it easy. So in that week, I'm going to earn $400. Now we're going to assume everybody's paying, nobody's canceling the appointments, all that. Okay, we're going to assume that I actually see that. Okay, so I do the work, I get paid. When all that money comes in, I'm going to see $400, right? Right. Yay, more money for me. Until I have to take some of that out and pay the taxes all myself. So that's the luxury of working for someone else. They pay the taxes. You don't even see it. You never even see that money. You might see a number on a pay stub, but you don't see the money. So as an independent contractor, you have to be mindful of it and say, I've got to save some money out so I can pay my taxes. So having to keep track of your taxes and, and pay it all yourself and everything is kind of a bummer, right? It's, yes, it is. However, there are a couple upsides, possible upsides to it. Number one is if you're the kind of person where you like to keep track of every single dollar, every single dime, know exactly what it's going for. Doing this, doing it this way as an independent contractor, where you have to keep track of everything, gives you a greater sense of control of the money. Um, but you have to be careful that you actually save that money and, and pay it to the government as necessary. Um, you don't want to cross the IRS. And, you know, you just don't. Um, the other other upside is 
if your business is doing well enough where you can actually afford to hire someone else to come in, that person can actually save you money and can maybe, especially if they're a, not just a bookkeeper but actually a, a tax professional, they're worth what you pay them because they can actually find ways for you to pay less taxes, legal ways, legal deductions now. They're not trying to, avoid, trying to evade the tax laws or circumvent it, but trying to use, trying to work within the laws now to legally reduce the amount you have to pay in taxes. So that's what Heather and I did. We, we actually, when our business got big enough, we hired someone to come in and do the taxes, do our, our bookkeeping and, and manage our taxes for us. We still had to pay the taxes, but she did all the figuring. Um, it also was nice having a, a freelancer do that rather than an employee handle that because when the time eventually came that Heather and I decided to close our business and move from Alabama to Texas, we didn't, you know, yeah, we quote unquote fired her, but not really fired her, but we just, we said, hey, we, we you know, we're closing our business, we won't need your services anymore kind of thing. Well, she wasn't out of a job because she's a freelancer. She had other clients that she went and worked for. You know, she just lost a client, but she still had work. So I didn't have that guilt of having to, to let someone go because I did have the same thing. We did have employees with our business, and it was a different thing having to tell them, hey, we're closing the business. We, we're going to have to let you go because we're closing the business. That was hard because these people, that was their job. That's what they depended on for their income. You know, that, that was difficult. So nice little perk of hiring another freelancer is you don't have that problem. So now the question is, can you make a living freelancing? Well, in many ways, the answer to that question really depends on you. But the short answer is, yeah, it's very possible. People do it all the time. But for a better answer than that, I'm going to defer to a lady by the name of Jill Stewartson. She has a YouTube channel called ASL Stew, and she's graciously given me permission to use clips from her videos in this presentation. So what you're going to see now is a clip from one of her videos entitled Freelance Interpreting Pros and Cons. Perhaps you pick. A con is possible financial instability. It might be that this month you have a lot of work and next month you barely have any work or no work. So that means that you have to really become good at budgeting your finances. You never know. You could have a good month, you could have a bad month. Another pro, which I kind of recently mentioned as a con, is you can work however many hours you want for the week or for the month. If there's enough available hours, uh, maybe in one month you could work a lot of hours, and then months, next month you could kind of relax a bit. You know, maybe you want to work more in the winter and the spring and in the fall time and do a lot of hours then and then try to kind of relax more or take vacation in the summer. For more on Jill's take on freelance interpreting, I encourage you to watch the rest of that video and her other videos. She's got a great, great series of videos on her YouTube channel. To get her take on interpreting as a regular employee instead of freelancing, I would highly encourage you to go check out her video, Interpreter Salary, Can You Live On It? So now let's switch gears and discuss interpreting itself. Uh, what is interpreting? Well, to start off with, let's dispel a myth right now. Uh, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but interpreting and translating are two separate things. They are not the same thing. They are similar but they are not the same thing. What do I mean by that? Translating is you're working with written text or passive language. Essentially, you're taking a text, a source text in one language. It could be a book, it could be a website, a poem, it could be a song, it could be uh, a technical paper, it could be a, anything. Anything that's written down in one form or another, you're taking that text and converting it from the source language to the target language. When you do this, I call it passive language because it's sitting there. You have this static text that you're working from. You, as you're working through it, you can stop, take time, and research a topic if you don't understand a particular word or how it's being used in that context. Um, if you think about just the English language, for example, and how many 
uses or how many how many different uses there are for the same word when you're working with written text as a translator you can you can take the time to what does this mean in that context oh that's what they're trying to say okay and then you translate it you know as needed um, so you have time to you can go back you can reread you can make sure oh I got a typo here oh I no, that's not really the best way to express that. I think this is a better way. I just couldn't think of it at the time. You know, you have all those kind of things that you can do when you're translating. You can you can go back and edit it and get it just the way you want it before you ever deliver it to the customer. Interpreting is different. You're working with active language. You're talking about signed or spoken language on the fly. You're in, you're interpreting right then. Now there are two different ways of doing it. One of them is called simultaneous translation, or I'm sorry, simultaneous interpreting. Um, where basically person starts speaking and while they're still speaking before they've finished delivering their message you're already translating or uh, interpreting you used to see I'm using the term wrong myself you while they're speaking before they finished you're already starting to do your interpretation you're already interpreting simultaneous translation is used usually uh, in uh, settings where you have a one-way communication going on. So you have a speaker who's giving like a lecture or a speech or something of that nature, you know, some other kind of presentation to an audience, and they're speaking and you're just interpreting that. And it's usually in a one-directional, so you only have to worry about going from this language to that language. Um, now, you know, usually that's the case. It's not always. Consecutive interpreting is is the other style where basically it's used in more intimate settings where or more personal settings where you have a dialogue going on between two people so this person over here is your, your the, the person giving the source message to begin with if they say whatever in their native tongue or whatever language they're most comfortable with you receive it you wait till they finish and then you do the mental gymnastics to convert it to the target language and then you come over here and you deliver it Okay, and then this person speaks back in that language, and then you do your mental gymnastics and convert it back over to this language. Okay, that's consecutive interpreting. Now, the consecutive interpreting, you have a little bit of an advantage because you get a little bit more time to think and process before delivering the message. So, but if you were to watch an experienced interpreter, you wouldn't notice the time difference. They're, they're doing it that quick. They're, their brains are so trained that you just don't notice it. Okay, so now we come to the point where we're going to put, put these two aspects together. What does a day look like for a freelance interpreter? What is, what is a typical work day? Well, first off, there is no real typical work day. But there are some things that, are, that can be fairly common from maybe not each individual day, but you have periods where it ebbs and flows and stuff. To give you a better example, since I've never actually worked as a freelance interpreter, or any other kind of interpreter at this point, um, I'm going to defer to another lady uh, who also has a YouTube channel. Her name is Amanda Ho Pham. She is actually a Vietnamese English tra uh, interpreter who lives in uh, Melbourne, city, uh, state of Victoria, Australia. And she also has given me permission to use uh, some good clips from her videos. What you're going to see here are two uh, clips from her videos. The first one is from A Day in the Life of an Interpreter, and the second one is from a video entitled All in a Day's Work, Interpreting. I said I realized that they booked me for three hours. I sat there and waited for an hour, catching up on all my emails and um, you know, uh, ringing people I needed to ring and also to just do some paperwork. And then when the patient got called in, and it was done and over in an hour and a half and they still paid me for three three hours so now i've got a bit of free time i might just dash home even though it's about 20 minutes drive or 25 minutes drive i would still go home and have a little rest before my next job at one o'clock or in the afternoon um, i'm here today for a standard job now a standard job is a 90 minutes job booked by the agent, uh, agency or booked by the client um, through the agency and the work is passed on to us. So interpreters, freelance interpreters, have to register with agencies, I'd say at least 
for four to five agencies to fill up their diary um, and to have um, enough work. And there is a lot of work. Um, and um, so um, in a day, a, a freelance interpreter will do anything between three to four or even or any, between three and five standard jobs. Um, and uh, on average, about three and a half jobs. Um, so on days where we do three jobs, it's very comfortable. Um, so you can imagine 90 minutes booked for each job and then about half an hour traveling time in between jobs. Um, and the rest is really a bit of free time for an interpreter to be able to do their personal um, things, uh, you know, uh, go and do some grocery shopping, uh, pay for some bills, um, read, um, uh, run some errands for the for for their family. Um, and today, for example, I um, station my work close to home so that I can dash in and out of home looking after the children. When I talk about children, they are not little children. They're fairly uh, older children and they are uh, at home um, because they're on school holidays. Um, so it is a, a really fantastic job when it comes to that type of flexibility. Um, you're still able to earn quite a good living and um, um, uh, you know, uh, take care of your family and work uh, as per hours that you desire or that suits your needs. So there are many different types of work available to interpreters. Freelancing is one of those types and in fact you know it can be varied as, as you just saw. Um, but I want to mention two more quick benefits. We're not really going to spend a lot of time on these but I want you to, to think about them as you as you consider this. Uh, if you decide to consider this as an option. Two other benefits to freelancing. The first one has to do with the fact that you can pick and choose what kinds of jobs you want to do. Uh, this gives you the option, maybe for example, let's say you're not someone who wants to freelance long term. All right, um, But this could be a way for you to kind of try before you buy, if you will, to, uh, to try different types. Maybe you want to try medical, maybe you want to try legal, maybe you want to try other things, education, you know, K-12 or, or university or whatever. You want to try all, uh, all kinds of different ones to find out what really you have a passion for. <clears throat> you might think it's one thing and then when you get, actually get into it you may find you hate it. But that doesn't mean you hate interpreting, it just means you didn't, don't necessarily like that niche. So freelance can give you a chance to try all kinds of things before you actually focus in one area. Um, the other thing being a freelancer can do is it can help you expand your network. You can meet new people all the time, uh, hopefully other, other people that work in the field, and in fact can be a, a way to potentially possibly lead you to an employer, a full-time employer, that you can work really well with. My goal in this video is not to persuade you to any particular point of view regarding freelancing or any particular decision. Instead, I hope I've provided you information so that you can see what options are available to you and not think you have to be pigeonholed into one particular thing. You know, a lot of times we, we might look at something and, and say, okay, well, what, you know, is this all there is? And really, with, with interpreting, there's a wide field out there. And so I hope I've, I've presented that to you. I'll conclude this with one more short video clip from Jill Stewartson. Um, and this is from her video, Why I Almost Quit Interpreting. And I would highly encourage you to go watch the whole video. But I love this one clip, and so I want to share that with you really quick. Interpreting. So I guess I wanted to tell you this story just to kind of warn you, or whether you're young and an ITP, graduating, a few years, or many years experience, it really doesn't matter. If you're feeling just not satisfied, I don't like interpreting, I'm not happy, First, take a step back and think about it. Is it because you don't like your work? Maybe you're in K through 12 and now you feel like, I don't like interpreting anymore. Maybe you need to switch to university work or freelance or medical or try and work so you can do legal or VRS. Something. There's so many different options for work right now. Don't quit right away or switch to a totally different field. I mean, if you want to, that's perfectly fine. You do not have to interpret for the rest of your life. But just think about it first. 
Thank you for watching. I've included below links to the videos that these clips are taken from. I highly encourage you to go watch them. These ladies have a lot of insight they've gained from years of working in the field. And I know that you can benefit from things they have to say, even if you're not going to be freelancing. They have a lot of other things to say uh, that can help you out in the field. See you next time.